excerpts from the book The Lost Americans by Professor Frank C. Hiben. Chapter 6, The Bering Straits The Front Door to America. Into the museum office one afternoon, there limped an old miner leaning heavily on a warp crutch and carrying his five-gallon hat in his hand. Miners are always interesting, and this one was especially so. He spoke not only of gold but also of bones and flint points. Fossil bones and flint points was a combination of information that never failed to elicit the most profound attention on our part. Sitting knee to knee with us in the dark office, he told his story, a story of cold and privation in the search for gold in Alaska, far from his native New Mexico to which he had returned to recover from severe frostbite. He had mined all over Alaska with the foremost of those who went to the Yukon in 98. Recently his diggings had been near Circle, Alaska, a town so named because of its location on the Arctic Circle. Here, in a deep pit in the Alaskan muck, he had encountered masses of dark colored bones of animals of gigantic size. Here and there the miners had picked up a flint point among the bones. Were we interested? As a matter of fact, the crippled miner was not the first one to draw our attention to Alaska. Almost as soon as our quest for the first American had begun, a number of occurrences had focused our researches in that direction. By merely looking at a map of the American Hemisphere, the region of Alaska appears as the most likely spot for the entry of man into the New World. We have already seen that other routes of immigration were impossible or extremely impracticable. As man did not develop in North and South America, we obviously must account for his appearance in these regions in some logical manner. Such geographic finger pointing on the atlas inevitably draws us to the area of the Bering Strait. This strait represents the closest contact of North America with any other old world land mass. This salient fact was recognized a very long time ago. In 1724, Peter the Great sent a Dane named Vitus Bering to see if Asia and America were joined. Vitus Bering and his officers had not actually ascertained that the two land masses were not one, when the explorer died in those same inhospitable regions. Only 56 miles of water separate the continents of Asia and North America at their closest point. Even this stretch of water is divided by the Diomed Islands, two tiny hillocks of rock that lie almost in the middle of the Bering Strait. With the Diomed Islands as stepping stones, it seems logical to suppose that man may have entered the New World by this route. The logic and handling the outlying gazetteer, our only methods of introducing man into the western continents, we would be on tenuous ground, indeed. There are other, more telling, arguments. With our original discovery of the Folsom Hunters in New Mexico, we also found certain indications which demonstrated that Folsom times were coincident with phenomena accompanying the great continental glaciation that closed the so-called glacial era. We had already become familiar with calculations of this sort by our researches in Europe. There, the history of ancient man is interwoven with the advances of the great continental ice sheets. These were far from inimical to man, for apparently, around their outskirts, man and the animals upon which he lived flourished. Indeed, it is these same continental ice advances and retreats that give us our best chronology of those remote times. We have now come to expect evidences of rainy periods long dried up rivers and lakes wherever Folsom man or other early men are concerned. When we consider the Bering Strait area in the light of our glacial knowledge in those regions, the results are tempting to contemplate. If we had for example, 
Tremendous masses of ice gathered around several centers on the North American continent, representing cubic contents of astronomical proportions. Very considerable amounts of the moisture content of the oceans of the world would be tied up therein. To illustrate this we have, of course, a glacial ice cap covering the region of the Antarctic continent at the present time. From our limited knowledge of this present-day glacial mass, we can gain some idea of what the continental glaciations were like in North America 10 or 15,000 years ago. If the ice in the Antarctic glacial cap were distributed evenly around the world, there would be enough frozen moisture to provide a layer of ice 120 feet thick over the entire globe. From almost inconceivable statistics of this sort, we can gain some idea of the masses of ice involved in these worldwide glacial phenomena. We can, then, presuppose a reduction in the levels of the oceans during the height of the glacial periods. As the waters of the Bering Strait are comparatively shallow even now, it would take very little such reduction to make the Straits dry land and to connect Asia and North America with an actual land isthmus. There is little doubt that this was the situation only a few thousand years ago. Even though this land bridge might have been broken by fluctuations of glacial masses and sea coastlines, there was at least ample opportunity for men and animals to cross from one place to the other. That this was actually the case, we can now demonstrate. At the present day the ice becomes thick in the Bering Strait in October of each year and freezes over completely soon afterward. Eskimos from the Siberian side trade freely with Alaskans during these winter months, and a lively traffic of dogs, men, and sledges moves back and forth across the ice. If ancient men did not walk dry shod over a land isthmus, they could easily do so over the winter ice. Glacial considerations, also, are important in Alaska. What if some intrepid hunter of ancient times had found his way through the front door to America, only to find himself confronted with a tremendous ice mass barring further progress? If such had been the case, no fulsome man, nor any other early hunter, would ever have been discovered on the New Mexico plains. Geologists have now mapped with fair certainty the extent of the ice masses of the glacial periods. In spite of the fact that we usually consider Alaska a land of snow and ice, we are perhaps surprised to find that it was little colder in those far off times than it is today. Glacial masses in Alaska were confined for the most part to the edges of the Alaskan Peninsula and the mountainous areas to the north and south. The central section, including the Yukon Valley, was almost entirely open and ice free. As we have already seen, men and animals lived in close proximity to the ice masses and flourished upon the abundant verdure and the moist seasons that were a concomitant of the glacial periods. Physically, so far as we are aware, during most of the glacial times, a fulsome man might have walked comparatively unimpeded across the Bering Strait, up through the valley of the Yukon, and thence across to the valley of the Mackenzie River and down into the reaches of Canada. The Aleutian Island chain has always figured in some of the arguments as to how man reached North America from Asia. Dr. Aylesherd Licke, of the Smithsonian Institution, spent many years in archaeological researches in these islands, trying to discover if there was any basis to such a supposition. As the Aleutian Islands are volcanic and consequently unstable over periods of several millennia, man's entrance via these rough and stormy stepping stones seems improbable. Likewise, even with the tip of the Aleutians lying close to the islands on the Asiatic side, there are still many miles of open sea which would have to be traversed in something like a fairly seaworthy boat. Then, too, 
We must not forget that we are dealing with hunters whose only weapons were the few flint tools that we have discovered on their campsites. It is foolish for us to contemplate that these first Americans had anything more seaworthy than a log that they might straddle from time to time to cross a river. By all logical accounts, the Bering Strait region is the most favorable spot to look for the first footprints of the newcomers to the Western world. We had discovered, too, in our researches throughout the southwest and the Great Plains area of North America, that Folsom Man was to be found over a considerable area. The Folsom Territory, we had discovered, embraced most of the western reaches of the Great Plains. Notably, as an outgrowth of newspaper and magazine articles on the discovery of these ancient men, a number of letters began to come in from out of the way places from persons who claimed to have fulsome points in their possession. Certainly one of the most outstanding features on the whole fulsome story is the fact that the fulsome points can be recognized out of context. So distinctive that when a rancher or a farmer writes in that he has found a fulsome point in the creek valley behind his house, we are fairly certain that he has done so. Most of our information as to the spread of Folsom Man came from sources such as these. Among other sources of information that looked extremely promising was a series of letters that kept dribbling in, early in the 1930s, from the Plains region of Canada. South Central Saskatchewan seemed to be a concentration point for these indications of Folsom remains. Scientists from the Smithsonian Institution and from the University of Pennsylvania made special trips to the regions of Saskatchewan and Alberta, to see whether the indications of Folsom Man were as favorable as they were by mail. The stories proved to be true. The ranchers had in their possession some dozens of bona fide Folsom points. This could only mean that Folsom Man had passed that way. This was a tremendous step in the tracing of the earliest hunters on this continent, even though we were doing that tracing, backward. If we could follow the tracks of Folsom Man back to their source, we would find his point of entry and probably also discover his time of entry into the new world. This is what we wanted, absolute proof of the advent of humans into these regions. We had found the end product. Now to discover the route by which man came. There were other glimmerings from the region of northern Canada and Alaska. In the tremendous gold pits in and around Fairbanks, Alaska, great quantities of fossil bones came to light. So many were discovered that paleontologists were attracted to this region more than to any other. In the plains area, and in other locations in North America where fossil bones have been found, they usually turn up in small quantities and in fragile condition. On the Folsom sites of Colorado or New Mexico, a good skull of a tailor's bison or a passable mammoth tusk is jacketed with plaster of Paris and carried back with loving care to the museum laboratory. It was astounding, then, to discover in the gold mines of Alaska bones of extinct animals in unbelievable quantities and sound condition, in some places, even, they were an actual impediment to mining. These bones are found all over the central region of the northern Alaskan peninsula, embedded in the typical Alaskan muck. As the gold-bearing gravels lie beneath this muck, the miners find themselves, out of necessity digging pits and shafts through the muck to get at the gold beneath. As the muck is eternally frozen, it is not only a great impediment to gold mining operations, but is also a wonderful preservative for any animal remains that might lie within it. In many places the Alaska muck blanket is packed with animal bones and debris in train load lots. Bones of mammoth, mastodon, Several kinds of bison, horses, wolves, 
bears and lions tell a story of the faunal population, which is the type of background we would expect in our search for early hunters. After all, if the animals were there, and the Folsom Points were present, could the hunters be far away? The Alaskan muck is like a fine, dark grey sand. It is very moist, is eternally frozen, and apparently has been so ever since the glacial age and the times of early men. Even in summer the ground thaws only about three feet down from the surface. Eskimo dogs in the warm Alaskan summers habitually dig shallow holes in the ground so that they may lie on the frozen muck beneath to keep cool. Within this mass, frozen and solid, lie the twisted parts of animals and trees intermingled with lenses of ice and layers of peat and mosses. It looks as though in the middle of some cataclysmic catastrophe of 10,000 years ago the whole Alaskan world of living animals and plants were suddenly frozen in mid-motion in a grim charade. Here we do not have to reconstruct so much from parched and weather-worn clues and tidbits. In the historical icebox of the Alaskan muck, large segments of the story of early men lie rigid and cold awaiting discovery. Is it any wonder that the old miner found our enthusiasm to fever pitch with his stories of bone beds stretching for miles beneath the mucks? Throughout the Yukon and its tributaries, the gnawing currents of the river had eaten into many a frozen bank of muck to reveal bones and tusks of these animals protruding at all levels. Whole gravel bars in the muddy river were formed of the jumbled fragments of animal remains. The picture was one of abundant animal life of a bygone era. If it is a hunter we seek, why not look where the game was most abundant? Even before the Alaskan deposits became known because of our gold mining operations in those regions, other quantities of bone deposits of extinct animals were known in Siberia. As early as 500 BC China was trafficking in fossil ivory tusks of mammoths from Siberia. Much of the early Chinese carving in ivory, which we consider so typically Chinese, was done with this fossil material, traded from the north. Thousands of pairs of mammoth tusks were exhumed in Siberia and sent into these trade channels. Since the tusks were dug out and traded by wild native tribes, men of the untrammeled and unmapped wilderness of Siberia, little knowledge of the origin of the fossils was ever procured. It was not until the last few decades that Europeans paid any considerable attention to these fascinating remains. When they did, they found a story of extinct animals involving numbers almost beyond belief. It was estimated that along the rivers of northern Siberia lay buried the remains of some 10 million animals of extinct varieties, whose death had been caused in some mysterious fashion. The Alaskan animal deposits, as they were revealed along the banks of the Yukon and in the great muck pits of the gold miners, were but a continuation of these Siberian bone beds. The species of animals on both sides of the Bering Strait were the same. In spite of our present nebulous knowledge of the Siberian side of the question and the muck deposits there, the situations were known to be similar. We had then, a picture, on both sides of the Bering Strait, of a country teeming with animal life, which lived upon the abundant verdure growing in the moisture created around the edge of the glacial masses. If the first Americans were hunters, as Folsom Man had demonstrated himself to be, this was a hunter's paradise. Added to these considerations of animals, which we had talked over on more than one scientific occasion, were other more concrete clues. In the gold pits in the vicinity of Fairbanks, Alaska, a few flint points had come to light along with other rather vague indications of fire and human habitation. The flint points, unfortunately, 
were not fulsome points. A few of them were faintly reminiscent of the classic Folsom flint tip with which we had become so familiar in the plains region. Some of the chip pieces of flint that turned up in the muck pits looked like nothing we had ever seen before. Also, there was ever present the question of where the points had originated. The muck blanket in these regions is from 4 to 90 feet thick. It is often difficult to tell, as the great hydraulic streams of water sluice away the muck, exactly where the flint points originated. If they came from the topmost layers of the muck blanket, they might be comparatively modern, or Eskimo in origin. If they were found deep within the muck layer, the judgment of greater antiquity was warranted. Most of the flint points were tantalizing indications of what might be discovered among the bones of the extinct animals rather than concrete historical evidence. We were not absolutely sure that the hunters had passed that way, even though on every hand the bones of the animals they hunted could be found. Possibly the teeming mammoth herds of Alaska were so numerous and so mighty that man could not survive there. On a previous trip to Alaska in 1931, we had stumbled into a curio store in Ketchika, in the southern portion of Alaska most frequently visited by tourists. The musty smell of stale whale oil and old leather, typical of the curio store, is hardly the atmosphere for scientific discoveries. On this occasion, however, we pounced with unscientific shouts of enthusiasm on a flint point that lay among the litter on one of the store shelves. It was a fulsome point, finely chipped and with the typical channel groove up either side. The curio store proprietor, unlike most of his kind, knew where the point had come from. Sure he said I know where it came from, Eagle Johnson, up at Selduvia, found it over on the north shore of Cook's Inlet, I paid him a candy bar for it. What's so different about it anyway? A real Folsom point in Alaska. A real piece of evidence upon which we might hang the whole history of early man in the new world. There was nothing vague about this piece of flint. We would have to fit out an expedition and search the place of its origin. The old miner leaning on his crutch was only one of the signposts pointing to Alaska as the original doorway to America. Accordingly, in the early summer of 1941, in a chartered boat, we set out from the port of Seattle, Washington, loaded with scientific equipment and enthusiasm for the regions of the North. We more than suspected that Folsom man, if our calculations proved correct, had come down through North America by an interior route, probably east of the mountains. However, the waterway to Alaska is not only the easiest, but also the best, for a scientific trip. For our investigations, we could reach fairly conveniently almost any part of Alaska by water. The first leg of the trip was north, along the coast, and thence by a short overland journey to the vicinity of Fairbanks. We would see for ourselves the great deposits of animal bones and discover, if we could, the traces of the early men who had lived in this animal world. The immensity of the gold pits was certainly not disappointing, nor were, indeed, the tremendous quantities of bone material that we found in and around them. The hydraulic jets of water which the miners used in their modern gold mining methods had sluiced away tremendous quantities of the overlying muck. In summer, beneath the short-lived Alaskan sun, the frozen muck masses dripped and fell away in sludgy masses. Within these oozing piles, the bones of mammoth, camel, horse, moose, and carnivores were everywhere in abundance. <laughs>
Most remarkable was their preservation, which seemed especially outstanding in contrast to the dry, chalky remains with which we were familiar in more southern regions. The frozen muck had preserved, in a remarkable manner, tendons, ligaments, fragments of skin and hair, hooves, and even, in some cases, portions of flesh of these dead animals. In one location north of Fairbanks, a bulldozer was being used to push the melting muck into a sluice box for the extraction of gold. With each passage of the dozer blade across the melting mass, mammoth tusks and bones rolled up like shavings before a giant plane. As the sun melted the black ooze in and around the bones, the stench could be smelled for miles around, the stench of some hundreds of tons of rotting mammoth meat, 10,000 years old. Apparently, a whole herd of mammoth had died in this place and fallen together in a jumbled mass of leg bones, tusks, and mighty skulls, to be frozen solid and preserved until this day. Only the greed of man for gold had opened up their long frozen grave. Day after rainy day we walked the pits, and followed the bulldozers, and trailed the streams of hydraulic giants. We became satiated with discoveries of perfect bison skulls with horns attached, or of mammoth skin with the long black hair still adhering to it. Even these wonders began to pale on us, for we found in the muck and doos and ditches no traces whatsoever of man. Frozen in the muck walls, or beaten out beneath the insistent pounding of the streams of water, were logs and twisted trees and branches and stumps. Here and there were layers of moss and peat, but nowhere in the muck could we find a layer of charcoal, or a fire pit or any of those other indications that we had come to associate with the campsites of the ancient hunters. Mammals the word in abundance, dumped in all attitudes of death. Most of them were pulled apart by some unexplained prehistoric catastrophic disturbance. Legs and torsos and heads and fragments were found together in piles or scattered separately, but nowhere could we find any definite evidence that humans had ever walked among these trumpeting herds or had ever seen their final end. On one particular rainy, dark afternoon, we were assisting one of the paleontologists in excavating the remains of an Alaskan lion, a great, striped beast with long fangs, slightly reminiscent of a Bengal tiger. He looked like a nasty customer in death, even though he was represented only by scattered bones in the black muck. All we sought for was the lower jaw of the lion in a newly revealed surface of muck, we found it, a flint point still frozen solid in the muck bank. It was of pink stone, finely chipped and gracefully shaped, and undoubtedly made by the hand of man. Its position was about 90 feet below the original surface. We photographed it in place, then removed it from the frozen ground, eagerly held it up, and turned it over for inspection. We washed the clinging muck from it in the muddy water beneath our feet. Although it was suggestive of a fulsome point, it lacked the channel grooves that are so characteristic. We did not know whether to be disappointed or elated. Three weeks searching, and we held in the palm of our hand one flint point, which was frozen near the carcass of an extinct animal. It might even have contributed to the death of that Alaskan lion of long ago. There was no doubt that some man had been there. Was it the fulsome man? Or was this the ancestor of Folsom Man who passed that way a thousand years before he reached New Mexico, and had fended off a striped lion? Where were the bones of the man who made this flint point? We had tramped the muck piles for weeks, and nowhere in the velter of bone remains had we found a single human fragment. There was still Eagle Johnson and the Folsom Point from Seldulvia.
On the map the location of Seldulvia does not look promising. It is a small fishing village on the very tip of the Kenai Peninsula of Alaska, and would not seem to be a logical stopping point for any migration from Siberia into the interior, but it was the source of our one concrete piece of evidence. We never reached Seldulvia. One of those vicious storms that whipped in from the Arctic waters of the Gulf of Alaska, drove us into a small harbor near the tip of the Kenai Peninsula. As our engines labored against the wind and we fought against the pounding waves to get our anchors out to hold us in the dubious lee of a small, rocky point, we could see through the driving sheets of rain and the gathering darkness a small fishing boat like ourselves seeking shelter. Two days we lay in this precarious position, fighting against the elements. As the wind and spray subsided, we looked forward to a visit from the fishermen on the neighboring craft. Even as the foremost of these swung his dripping boots over our rail, we asked him the inevitable question, Do you know Eagle Johnson? Eagle Johnson? Sure, I knew him. He's been dead for a couple of years. Eagle Johnson dead. The word sounded like the end of an unsuccessful scientific experiment. Now we would never know. The one tenuous link that we had with the whole story was gone. But there was one more chance. We had in the cabin two or three fulsome points that we had brought for this purpose. We had shoved these points under the nose of every Alaskan we had encountered for just this reason. In most cases the fishermen and miners and prospectors who looked at the points had merely shaken their heads and said something like, mighty peculiar flints they don't look Indian to me. On this occasion, however, with the rain of the dying storm soil beating down on the deck and the points held out in our wet hands, we waited with more than usual expectancy. The foremost of the fishermen who had come aboard, looked at the Folsom points for a full moment. A shake of his head and our whole trip was a failure. Why, if you are so damned interested, seems to me I remember Eagle finding a lot of those flint points and bones over at Quinitna Bay. That night we celebrated in our tiny cabin with our fishermen friends as though we had discovered Folsom Man himself frozen in a solid block of ice. Quenitna Bay lies directly across Cook's Inlet on the southern side of the Alaskan Peninsula. In distance, it is not too far from the Yukon Valley and the Bering Strait area. The bay, however, is within the volcanic belt which so characterizes the Aleutian area. Iliamna Volcano, with a plume of white steam issuing from a vent in its side, towers above Quinitna Bay like a live sentinel. It is hardly a region where one would look for Folsom Man. The Fairbanks Bone Pit seemed much more likely, but we had looked there. In the shallow waters of Quinitna Bay, we could find only one place to anchor our small boat. A hundred yards distant from the anchorage on the west shore of the bay, a small creek flowed into the tidewater. It must have been here that Eagle Johnson and his fishermen friends had put in from time to time to get fresh water. With Eagle Johnson dead, we might have an extremely difficult time locating any evidences of ancient man in the tremendous area. It was with considerable doubt and many misgivings that we landed our skiff on the gravel beach and stepped out of the place we had come so far to examine. Just above high water mark, the tracks of a Kodiak bear skirted the driftwood and seaweed. At the inland side of the beach was a bank, eaten away by the waves and tides of just such a storm as we had experienced. The top of the beach was strewn with stones and debris which had been washed out of this bank. We had not far to go, 
just as Eagle Johnson must have done before us, we walked up the beach near the mouth of a small, unnamed stream. The glitter of flint among the dull pebbles in the sand caught our eyes. There was a familiar shape among the litter of material at the bottom of the bank. It was as though we had never left New Mexico at all. There was no doubt about it. Lying face up, with its characteristic groove and outline revealed at a glance, was a Folsom Point. We had found it, a Folsom Point in Alaska, and in place. We had backtracked Folsom Man almost to his starting point. Our suppositions and logic had now become certainty. As we ranged excitedly up and down the beach, we found everywhere the chips of flint and bits of charcoal that indicated that man had been there. Protruding here and there from the bank, or shattered in sodden fragments on the beach, were the bones of mammoth. Mammoth gave us the time, the flint points gave us the picture. Here was a campsite of ancient men who had killed and eaten now extinct animals. Up and down the beach the evidence was littered, concentrated in places, then for a few hundred yards represented only by a flint chip or scattered bone. In our hurried search of the first afternoon we found no human bones at all. That night another storm struck and our small boat tagged and strained at the two anchors like a live thing. Three more days the tides and the wind raced in and out of Quinitna Bay like elements possessed. Only a few short yards away was the place we had come so far to see, and we could not even get ashore. On the third day we landed for a brief period to further explore the site and take some photographs. After a few hours the wind grew stronger and we got back to the boat just in time. That night a veritable gale shrieked over the water of the bay and churned the tips of the waves to driving pellets of water. Certainly, if the weather was as bad in Folsom times as it is now, there would appear to be no reason why any hunters had ever stayed there, no matter how good the hunting was. A week after we had come, we limped out of Quinitna Bay with great reluctance, but with the firm resolve that we would come back and excavate there in the near future. What we had found in a whole summer's cruise to Alaska could be contained in an old hat. The implications involved, however, were epic making. We had demonstrated that man came to the new world by the front door, across the Bering Strait, and had lived first in Alaska. We would have to search farther to find each one of his footprints as he made his way into the interior of Canada and thence down to Saskatchewan, Alberta, and the Great Plains. But the story was becoming much clearer. The first American was no longer in mystery.